Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When we look at the teaching of God's Word, we see a very significant verse which says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I think we would have to agree that those are pretty strong words, and here's the problem. Many people have fallen in love with money. And if that's the case, that puts that individual in a position spiritually where the enemy is able to manipulate him and move him or her wherever the enemy wants. In other words, it gives a stronghold for the enemy in that person's life. So ask yourself a very important question, and that is, do you love money? Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 19, the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Now, hopefully, you'll recall last week, in the previous study, we encountered a very young man, but we found out that this young man had great possessions. He was very wealthy. And when Messiah challenged him, if he wanted to be perfect, right with God, following after him, Messiah says, go and sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Well, because of this one's commitment, not to God, but to wealth, his own wealth, he turned away, and remember what we said, he was exceedingly sad. My hope is that we are not people who are sad because of the wrong decisions, but that we humble ourselves and we respond to God's instructions, not logically, but rather in faith, according to his truth, acknowledging that he is always right and it's always in our best interests and the interests of others for us to obey God, trust him, rely upon him, and do what his word says. Now, in this 19th chapter, where we're going to pick up, notice what Messiah says, verse 23. But Yeshua said to his disciples, truly I say to you that with difficulty, that means something that he's talking about here is very, very hard, very rare. So he says, with difficulty, a rich man, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So with difficulty, or as many translations say, it is simply something very hard for a wealthy man, a rich individual, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we hear that, we need to be accurate. Nowhere in the scripture says if you have such and such amount of money, that amount of money will keep you out of heaven. That's not what it's saying here. He says with difficulty, it will be hard. Why? Because people tend to, when they have wealth, financial resources in abundance, they simply trust in that wealth rather than trusting in God and obeying him. And let me give you one very good example of this from the scripture. I'm speaking about one of the kings of Judah, a man by the name of Asa. Asa was king, and God said something to him. When Asa became the king, God says, you are going to have 10 years of quietness. Now that means peace. You're not going to have war. 
And Asa, what did he do? He was a wise individual. He used this opportunity to bring about spiritual reforms within his kingdom. He got rid of the high places where people would commit idolatry. He got rid of a certain type of tree where people would use that tree in order to commit sin and do other false worship. So Asa was an individual that was faithful, obedient to God. And God granted him peace. He granted him prosperity. These reforms that he utilized, that he instituted, brought about within his kingdom great prosperity. And he used those financial resources in a wise way. And his kingdom grew strong. And later on, when he was attacked, what did he do? He trusted in God. And this obedience, and here's a very important biblical principle, his obedience to God brought about spiritual revelation. God sent a prophet to him. And that prophet gave him greater insight, wisdom, identified some problems within his kingdom, And once again, Asa was able to use that in order to strengthen his kingdom. And also, it grew wealthier, more prosperous. There was great prosperity in his days. But here's what happened. Later on, towards the end of his life, he was attacked. He was attacked by a confederacy. Now, remember, at this time, the nation of Israel had a divided monarchy, meaning there was not one kingdom but two. The northern kingdom retained that name Israel, and it was five times larger than the southern kingdom called Judah. Even though King Asa, he was in Jerusalem, that's where his kingdom was based, in the kingdom of Judah. What happened was this. The king of Israel wanted to attack. He began to strengthen himself strategically in military, taking key places, and he did something else. He made an alliance with the king of Aram, that is Syria, that was based in Damascus. And this confederacy intimidated King Asa. And you know what he did? Instead of turning to God, instead of seeking God in prayer, instead of worshiping God for God to give him insight to know what to do and how to respond, instead of turning to a prophet of God, what did King Asa do? Well, remember, because of his faithfulness, his obedience, his humility, his kingdom was was prosperous. And the word of God says that he went and he took a large sum of money from the king's treasury, his own wealth, and also from the temple treasury. And in essence, he made a bribe to the king of Syria. And that solved his problems. But listen to this. It solved his problems in the short term. And if you read carefully in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, 15, and 16, you know what? God wanted to give him a greater victory. God wanted to take him and even raise him up higher, but because he trusted in his wealth, utilize his finances to solve the problem rather than relying upon God. Well, he ended very poorly. He did not finish faithfully And God was very displeased with him. So wealth can be a blessing if we do not allow that wealth to turn us away from trusting God. And this, unfortunately, is very rare. And that's why Messiah says, look again at our verse, verse 23. Truly, I say to you that with difficulty, it is hard for a wealthy man to enter into the kingdom 
of heaven. Again, I say to you, now this word again means I'm going to add to what I've just said. I'm going to provide greater clarity to that statement. That's how it's understood in the original language. So look at verse 24. But again, I say to you, it is easier a camel through an eye of a needle to enter than a wealthy one, a wealthy man, a wealthy woman into the kingdom of God to enter. Now, again, strong statement. Why? Because money. Money easily, quickly turns a heart of a person that was bent towards God, sensitive to God's word. When that wealth comes, it frequently, usually, with great regularity, turns someone away from spiritual truth and they begin to rest trust and rely upon their wealth and that's why messiah says what he says with great difficulty it's easier for a camel to to enter in through the eye of the needle and there's many discussions about what that is and we'll put that aside because the teaching is clear it is something that is difficult. Many say that the eye of the needle that, that Yeshua was referring to had to do with a place in Jerusalem or in a walled city where in order for the camel to pass through that, you would have to remove all of his supplies, all of the things that the camel was carrying. So it's only when you w remove all of these supplies or, or, or possessions that you wanted to sell in a city or whatnot, it's only when you are empty, then and then, then and only then, can you enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because when you're lacking, it, it causes someone to trust more in God. Look now to, to verse 25. But his disciples... After hearing, we read that they were exceedingly astonished. Now, why was that? Because they had believed a false teaching. And what is that teaching? The false teaching is that one's wealth is an indicator of their, their spiritual position, where they are with God. If someone has great wealth, then they're closer to God. So when they heard this, their theology was, was challenged. And let me share with you something that, that you need to understand, and that is this. The more that you study the Word of God, the more that your theological beliefs, your doctrine, will be challenged. Don't believe simply something because you hear. Remember what Paul says, yes, faith comes by hearing, but he also says, hearing the word of God, not necessarily someone, whether it's me or someone else, someone's interpretation. That's why the scripture says, study, study for yourselves in order to show yourselves approved. We are each responsible. And that's why we go through the word of God slowly, verse by verse, word by word. Once more, verse verse. 20, 25, but his disciples, after hearing, were exceedingly astonished, saying, who therefore is able to be saved? Now, this is a clear indication of what I shared with you, because they thought that wealth was somewhat of a sign, an indicator of one's spiritual condition. It is not necessarily an indicator in fact we see an emphasis upon the poor the poor in spirit that is the humble and those that that trust trust god remember that account of that that poor widow that placed a small amount but because she gave of everything 
She gave out of her need what she truly needed to survive, but she gave it nevertheless. Messiah saw this as an act of trust, an act of dependence, and that's why he spoke so favorably to her. Verse 26. After they said what they said, therefore who is able to be saved? Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, he looked and said to them, and this is another very well-known scripture, he says, with man, this is impossible. What this scripture reveals to us is this, for everyone, did you hear that? For everyone. When, when wealth comes to that person, it is in a natural condition left to that person by themselves alone. That wealth will have a spiritual corrupting influence in their life. Just will. That is for the natural one. But he says here, keep reading because if we stop there, we, we don't have the complete truth of God. He says, with man, me, man alone by themselves, left to themselves, this is impossible. But with God, with God, all things are possible. And this means that, and I've seen many examples of this, there are numerous people who are with God, that is, in a covenantal relationship with him. They have a faith, a faith that's founded upon and established by the word of God. And God blesses them with, with financial resources. With God, they're able to handle, to be a good, a godly steward of those resources and bear testimony in how they manage them of their faith, their commitment to God. So that's why he says, left by yourself, man and man alone, it is, he says literally, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Verse 27, shouldn't surprise us. The disciples, they're asking this question. And who's going to speak? We already know. It's Peter. It's always Peter. He's never lost for words. And notice what he says. Verse 27, then Peter, he answered, he said to him, behold, we have left everything and we have followed you. Now, what a statement. He's saying, we have made a decision, these disciples, to leave everything in order to follow after you and they had made sacrifices many were married had families and such and they left that now that doesn't mean that they didn't provide for their families but they made a great commitment and their fact family had to make a sacrifice for them to be one of the 12 disciples so Peter says, and pay attention to this middle verse 27, behold, we have left everything and we have followed you. What therefore will be to us? Now, Peter's speaking and he asked this question and notice the response, verse 28. And Yeshua said to them, not just to Peter, but to all disciples. And let me share with you that this has relevancy for you and me. When we make sacrifices for serving our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, the Son of God, the Christ, when we make sacrifices in, in serving Him, what does the Scripture say in the book of, of Hebrews? That He is not unjust to forget any of our good deeds which means he's just and he will remember all that we do in his name all that we do to serve him verse 28 but yeshua said to them truly i say to you that you the 
ones that follow after me. In the, and pay attention to this word, in the regeneration. Now, that is oftentimes a very rich, a very well-packed word theologically. Many talk about regeneration. But in this context, it's being used slightly differently. It's being used to speak about a time, a regeneration that is a type of rebirth or recreation, a new reality for what? For this world. And notice what he says in the context here. He says, in the regeneration, now he's going to define what he means. Whenever, it's in the subjunctive, there's no date or time given, so he says, whenever the Son of Man shall set. Now, this is important, shall sit. This is important because what is uncertain here is not that Messiah is going to sit upon the throne. What is uncertain is from our standpoint, the reader, and from the disciple's standpoint, what is uncertain is when he will do that, when he will sit upon the throne. But there's nothing uncertain. He will be sitting upon that throne ruling. Once more, middle of verse 28, truly I say to you that you, the ones who have followed after me in the regeneration, that is, whenever the Son of Man should sit upon his glorious throne, and that's exactly what it says, upon his glorious throne, what's going to be the outcome for these disciples? He says, you shall sit also on 12 thrones, doing what? Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I want to ask a question because many people use this scripture incorrectly. They say, there it is, the disciples, i.e. the church, are going to judge Israel. And they use that in kind of a condescending and a condemning way. But what I would say to such misguided people is this. I would ask them, what is the difference between the word that's used here, krino, in its basic form, and the word katakrino? And the reason why I say that is this. If someone doesn't know the difference and why one is used and one's not, they're really not qualified in order to give an f- opinion, to have a view concerning the scripture. It would be the same way as someone who says, well, I'm a a doctor, I'm going to practice medicine. And this person asks a very basic question about medicine and they do not know at all what the, the subject even is relating to in regard to that question. So the word katakrino means to judge down, we would translate it to condemn. This word does not mean in this context because of the lacking of kata, that preposition or prefix. It's a preposition and it's also used in that word for a prefix. It's not there. So it's not saying condemn that the disciples are going to be condemning Israel. What it means is this. They're going to be evaluating. And this simply supports something, even though the the 12 disciples, and of course, Judah's going to be replaced, but the 12 disciples, and we see this in the book of Revelation, they are going to have a very exalted position. But do not think that Israel is going to be left out. God, in the last days, and the prophets speak of this over and over and over. In the last days, there is going to be a remnant of Israel after the rapture that is going to come to faith in Messiah Yeshua. And we also know that in that kingdom, speaking about the millennial kingdom, it says that that we are going to rule and reign with Messiah, that, that believers are going to have a position of authority. It's just telling us here, that these disciples are going to have a more exalted, a greatly significant position of sitting. Notice what he says here. You are going to sit 
upon the 12 thrones, evaluating, judging, but it's not necessarily a word of condemnation. It's a word of, of uh, ruling in the sake of wanting to, to bless, help, provide wise counsel. So he says, you will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel, verse 29. And all, notice what he says, and everyone who has left homes or brothers or sisters or father or mother and the Texas Receptus, probably your Bible does not, but the Texas Receptus also has wife. So if someone has left their home, their, their siblings, their parents, and as it says here, or wife, or children, or fields, on account of, and pay attention, on account of my name. Now here, name is synonymous with authority, but it's also wanting to be like him to have his same character, name, authority. Sometimes it's character. Sometimes in this case, it's both. They are recognizing the authority of Messiah and they're also wanting to be like him, to have those same types of, of character traits, to be loving, gracious, kind, compassionate, mercy, and merciful, and to be a blessing. He says, I want to read it again. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields on account of my, my name, a hundredfold, what a blessing, a hundred thrill he will have an eternal life he will inherit. What a wonderful promise, a hundredfold and also kingdom life it says eternal life but that word eternal relates to the kingdom kingdom life and then he closes last verse verse 30 but many first ones will be last and the last will be first he speaks about a a transition that is going to be very surprising for many those who were first they're going to be last and those who are last, they're going to be first. What are we speaking about? Well, that's exactly what we're going to begin with next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>